I'm Marty Stauffer. Dry and desolate for most of the year, our desert southwest comes alive in spring. It's early April as I begin a five-month ride from the border of Mexico all the way to Canada. We'll follow springtime north along the backbone of the Rocky Mountains as we search for wildflowers. My horse Buck, my mule Maggie and I will travel 3,000 miles up through five states, 25 national forests, and three national parks. Our journey begins here on the Mexican border, just south of Lordsburg, New Mexico. Saddle up and join us as we follow the continental divide from border to border and zoom in on wildflowers. Heading north through the fragrant creosote bushes, we pass a yucca. This remarkable plant, the New Mexico state flower, is a good source of food for desert wildlife and was used for food and soap by both Native Americans and settlers. Its blossoms are truly lovely. Each desert flower has its own unique and complex system of survival. This ocotillo is a survivor that conserves moisture by dropping its leaves when water is scarce. It may do this several times in a single year. The prickly pear cactus is also well adapted to dry country. A waxy coating prevents evaporation. Javelinas are one of the few wild animals that can eat cactus, stems, spines, and all. The spines are actually leaves where photosynthesis takes place. As evening falls, we hurry to make camp. Come on, Maggie. Come on, Buck. Come on, Buck. We're on the trail early to catch the beauty of sunrise at Chaco Canyon.
these abandoned ruins seem to echo voices and wisdom from the past. Wildflowers of the high desert bloom where a family once lived. The ancient ones had other names than we do for plants and other uses than we may know. It's sad that much of their knowledge is now lost to us forever. Native Americans made a tea from the seeds of the columbine. It cured headaches and fever. But they knew that the seeds of these poppies are poisonous. Many kinds of wildflowers are still used by the Navajo weavers of today as natural dyes for beautiful wool rugs. Traditional methods of dyeing and weaving have been passed down from generation to generation for hundreds of years. Entering an area of pinyon juniper habitat, we come to an immense natural formation, Echo Amphitheater. Oh, ah, hold it here. I'm getting sore. I'm not used to this. Okay, you guys wait right here. Wait here, I'll be right back. Wait here, please. Just wait here. Hope. Don't set a bad example for Maggie. Stay here. Dissolved minerals have streaked these canyon walls with desert varnish. Even in this sandy soil, tiny flowers brighten the scenery. Up on the canyon rim, one of my favorites, bighorn sheep are feasting on the flowers of spring. At this time of year, the ewes and lambs are banded together. The flowers are beautiful and obviously tasty. A welcome variation from the bighorn's usual diet of grasses and forbs. As we move on from Echo Amphitheater along the Continental Divide into Colorado, the terrain changes. At this higher altitude, the plant life also changes, and we enter a new and exciting world, with a lot more moisture.
The delicate pasque flower is one of the very first to bloom at this altitude. This bright yellow field is not filled with native wildflowers at all, but rather an import, the common dandelion. Originally from Eurasia, the dandelion is now the most universal of plants. Pretty, but it crowds out native species. Old time pioneers thought if they dried this wildflower, fleabane, and stuffed it into their mattresses, they would be rid of fleas. More than 50 varieties of wild daisies grow here in the Rockies. They are among the 15,000 species of wildflowers found north of the Mexican border. With so many plants to look for, I never know what surprising wildflower or wild animal I'll spot next. Will it be a fritillary butterfly on a butterfly weed? Or a little red elephant with its elephant head shaped flowers? Maybe I'll see a skyrocket gilia that's often called a fairy trumpet. Flax, the source of linen. Or even lupin. 10,000 year old frozen lupin seeds have been known to germinate. Since flowers first appeared on our planet 100 million years ago, they have been the source of high energy foods needed for animal and human survival. Their pollinators include butterflies, birds, and bees. Seeds are also unwittingly carried to new locations by various animals. Continuing on, I spot the Colorado state flower, the columbine. Once, columbine covered great expanses of these mountains, but people loved them too much. Flower trains carried city dwellers to the high country to pick columbine by the armful. As a consequence, there may never be as many columbine again. You know, it's just amazing how you can stare into a fire for hours. It's fascinating. It just draws your eye in. I wonder. You wouldn't know why that is, would you? <laughs> no, I didn't think so. I didn't think so, Maggie. But it's an interesting philosophical concept. Fire gazing does evoke thoughts of philosophy, and I remember the words of William Blake. To see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. The next part of our journey takes us up into the spectacular wilderness of Rocky Mountain National Park and the incredible wildflowers that survive at elevations of 12,000 feet and up. Even though it's now summer, there is still snow in these high mountains. Here, along the crest of the Great Divide, wildflowers thrive, even on the alpine tundra. Weather conditions are so severe that vegetation huddles close to the ground, and the season of warm weather is so short that spring, summer, and autumn wildflowers all bloom at once. The difference between these alpine flowers and their cousins in the Arctic is that here, the growing season is actually shorter and the air is much thinner. 
Like the plants of the tundra, this ptarmigan sports summer colors. In winter, its plumage is pure white, camouflaged for snow. As white as ptarmigan in winter, these marsh marigolds rush to bloom as soon as the snow melts. In fact, sometimes these hardy members of the buttercup family are so eager to blossom that they don't wait. They shove their way right up through the snow. Their cousins, snow buttercups, can be even pushier. These yellow beauties are the very first flower to bloom on the tundra. They too will bore a hole through the snow with their own heat and even blossom before they get to the top, sometimes several feet below the surface of the snow. Some plants of the tundra may grow only one or two leaves a year and may be over a hundred years old. Many alpine flowers, like these forget-me-nots, are only a few inches high. Yet some alpine wildflowers have roots that are three inches in diameter and reach six feet deep. Others have a leafy cushion designed to hold in heat. In this land of sagebrush, what little moisture falls does not flow east or west. It seeps into the dry, sandy soil. Then sagebrush captures it through extensive root systems and supports the growth of other plant life. A buck pronghorn browses on the tender new shoots of sage, while nearby a pronghorn doe passes the life-giving energy of sage onto her newborn twins. At an elevation of over 7,000 feet, we find a surprising variety of cactus. They remind me of the New Mexican desert where our adventure began three months ago. Blooming cactus, the song of the meadowlark, and these prairie dogs testify to the fact that what may initially appear to be a desolate wilderness, Wyoming's Great Basin, is actually a land teeming with life. A few hundred miles farther north in Wyoming, Buck, Maggie, and I re-enter the Rockies on a carpet of color. These are yellow monkey flowers. Over there are bluebells. And here are white bog orchids. And these are flowers that almost everyone recognizes. Indian paintbrush. Okay, Maggie, you can eat a little bit here, but now don't eat these red ones. These are Indian paintbrush or Wyoming paintbrush. 
Wyoming State Flower. That's a good girl, just eat around them. Yeah. It's strange how sometimes you get the feeling that something's watching you. This time, I see the chicks, but the great horned owl parents are probably off hunting. All right, that's enough, come on now, let's go, let's go. There are more than 200 species of paintbrush in North America. 19 of those are found in Wyoming's neighboring state, Idaho, where we'll travel next. A surprising fact about all paintbrush is that the red petals are actually brightly colored leaves. Moving on through Yellowstone Park, we come to a burned area and recall the great fires of 1988. In my mind's eye, I can see the pillars of flame that swept through here and cleaned up a couple hundred years worth of deadfall. Some were bothered by the burns, not me. I'm always amazed at the miracle of Mother Nature. Here in the ashes, seeds that were dormant for years sprang to life. Burned meadows and forest floors sprouted new growth. And wildflowers were among the very first to regenerate. In fact, many seeds must be subject to fire in order to sprout. Who knows how long these thousands, millions of precious yellow flowers have waited for the perfect combination of soil, light and moisture for their turn to grow. After a forest fire, fireweed rushes to cover the burned areas. It also provides valuable forage for wild game, deer, elk, even grizzlies. In the fading rays of sunset, fireweed can look like a bed of glowing embers. I love the way its flowers slowly bloom up to the top of the stalk. Days are getting chilly now as we travel up through a corner of Idaho, then into Montana, and toward another of America's great national parks, Glacier, right on the Montana-Canada border. The million acres of Glacier includes wildflowers of the prairies, evergreen forests, high meadows, and alpine tundra. At St. Mary Lakes, we encounter an elk herd frolicking in the water, having a great time. With autumn approaching, some wildflowers, like this milkweed cotton sedge, have gone to seed, while others, like yarrow cow parsnip, continue to bloom. We've seen harebells like these since northern New Mexico, 
They grow from foothills to tree line and are one of the most common wildflowers in the Rockies. But why do you suppose they're called harebells? The nickname mock orange for sweet-smelling syringa, state flower of Idaho, at least is obvious. So is bitterroot, the state flower of Montana, and glacier lilies, also called dog-tooth violet. Here, glacier lilies make a colorful garnish on this mountain goat salad. In fact, parts of these peculiar and beautiful plants form a major food group for moose, bighorn, and bear, not to mention many other creatures, large and small. This wildflower has one of the most picturesque names of all, butter and eggs. It's not hard to guess where that name came from. One of the outstanding and unique wildflowers of Glacier National Park is bear grass, which is not really a grass at all, but a tall stalk with a cluster of hundreds of small single flowers. That cluster may be as much as eight inches tall. Bear grass does not flower every year, sometimes only once in every five to seven years. Bear do sometimes eat the tender spring leaves, an observation that may have led to its name. As autumn winds scatter seeds for next year's flowers, this year's season of wildflowers draws to a close. It's now time to head back home. It's been a great summer to zoom in on wildflowers. I'm Marty Stauffer. Until next time, enjoy our wild America.